Thank you. So I'm Anders, um, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I wanted to let this talk be about these uh, these patterns, this side project I've been having. But um, I've been uh, I recently got this prototype back, and I've been testing it. And along that way, um, I found out that it's actually kind of hard to use them, uh, and you need some um, need some you have to need a kind of certain mindset to 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 use it correctly. Um, so that's what the talk is going to be about. And then I'm going to show some patterns along the way. Um, and I'm going to show a lot of examples. And um, when you see one, I'll probably say, well, this is uh, this card, or this is scarcity, this is uh, achievements, or whatever. Uh, so whenever you see something popping up, that's a card. Um, anyway, the starting point of this presentation is that you have a great product. Um, how many of you guys? think you're building a great product. Can I have a show of hands? All right, that's good. You got self-confidence. Um, how many of you are struggling to get that product to grow? Man, no, no one? You're pretty successful. Really, seriously, how many of you are struggling to get it to grow? Or how many of you would like to get bigger or grow bigger? All right, that's, you got my point. All right, so the the starting point of this presentation is that you have a good product. There are no obvious problems you've done. You just build it each to done everything that you should, everything by the book. Um, but the problem is that you're not the only one with a good idea or a good product. There are so many uh, other people out there. It's a, it's a Red Sea. Um, so that one product, so if you look at the metrics, you have a, uh, probably have a high bounce rate, or at least higher than you'd like. Um, people are just leaving earlier than uh, you think they should. Um, and the metrics aren't really working for you. And then my question is, why are you looking only at the metrics? Because it's not only about the metrics. Ultimately, this frustration thing and seduction is about love, right? So if your product or somebody that you are dating, a guy or a girl, how, how would you describe that product? In dating terms, it would probably be something like this. She's got great personality. Um, and you probably know what that means. Uh, it's like she's not that seducing, or at least, well, she's pretty boring, and she, she's not driving me along. So in product terms, this would be the same as, well, I'm a good product if you just got to know me. Because deep down inside, we're all good. We have good intentions. We have something to offer. Um, so with this frustration thing, you need to, you need to treat it like a relationship. Um, so the question is then, what do you want? Do you want a lasting relationship? Or do you want a one-night stand? When you do persuasion efforts, or just any efforts, actually, you need to consider the customer journey. And the mechanisms that you use or the approach that you use is very different from when you're trying to seduce people to trying to get them to stay in love. So trying to seduce people, it could probably be a design-up problem. So people are interested, but they aren't really motivated to give it a try. Next is falling in love. So People got started, but they don't know what to do or how to get started. And then finally, staying in love. That's the ongoing engagement problem. And that's going to be kind of the agenda for this presentation. Um, I'm going to start from the top and walk you through all the way to the bottom. So let's start with being seduced. All right, Groupon. I hate Groupon because I don't want to be a person that buys stuff from Groupon. But I am. Um, and, or at least I sign up for it, and because I don't want to miss out. There gotta be some some deal sometime that that appeals to me. So why does this work? Because I'm I'm not obviously I'm not that interested in that product. Well, it's one of those cards. It's scarcity. So by putting a time limit on it, on on me buying the product, they're forcing me to act. They're forcing me to make a decision. So there are different mechanisms they can use to make people take action. So why does this work? 
I mean, it, it, it looks good, but it, I mean, it's not, it's not fantastic. Um, it's usable, right? So it wasn't usable, or, or it wasn't the usability, or it wasn't a pretty interface that made it work. So what made it work? Normally, we tend to focus a lot on usability. So that's evening out all the bumps in the road. So that's removing friction, right? It's a great uh, thing, uh, thought uh, by Joshua Porter here. Um, so normally, we focus on removing friction. And you can think of that as like a vector, or like a force holding you back, right? But what if we thought about how we can get people to move in the other direction, right? So that's motivation. What are our tools then? So then it's about psychology. So that's kind of the basis of my talk. Can we actually look in another direction than just usability? This whole trip for me started um, when I was a Ruby and Rails developer. That was uh, eight years ago, and I was uh, working remotely for the summer um, at my, my brother's place. He lives in Venice Beach in California. He has this uh, chain of ice cream stores called Nice Cream. Um, and every single day, I would just meet in in his shop, in his main shop, and uh, I'd just sit there and program. Um, and I was just, I would just notice this tipping jar that um, at 12, 1 o'clock, until then, there was no tip in the jar. Then one guy put money in the jar, and then certainly other people started tipping as well. And then from that point on, a lot of tips came in. Like, why does this happen? And it happened every single day. So we played around with it and put $1 bills in a jar early in the day, and then the st people started tipping earlier. And one night, we went out uh, in a bar, uh, and it was kind of empty, um, so there was no one to talk to, so I talked to the bartender about this. Um, and he said, yeah, of course, we have a name for that. It's called salting the jar. And he also told me that uh, if they put $5 bills in a the jar, p then people are going to put $5 bills in the jar as well. If they, if they put, start with to put $10 bills in the jar, then people are going to put $10 bills in the jar. So he called it solding the jar. So just there is, is, is actually an example, it's an excellent example of uh, several different uh, psychological principles in effect. Um, one of them is this concept of social proof. Um, the fact that we tend to follow the patterns of, of people that we, we think are like us. So when we come into a bar and we don't know if this is an expensive or cheap place, we tend to do what everybody else does, right? So that got me kind of excited and went back to the literature and it's like, what, what about what is this persuasion thing? And the first thing that popped up was rhetorics. And this is some, some really old stuff, actually. And so especially one guy, uh, which a lot of you, if you studied the design and or communication, have probably stumbled upon this guy called Aristotle. Okay, so his thoughts are 2,000 years old, but they're actually, they still hold true today. And a lot of them can be easily applied to, to, that, to the digital world we live in now. And he talked about what makes a persuasive argument. He talked about public speaking, but if you want to have a speech and you want to persuade your audience, what do you do? And, he's, and he, thought about, uh, he talked about three different appeals. And now this is Greek, but it's, he called it logos, pathos, and ethos. So logos is, 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 is all the rational stuff, the facts and statistics, is informed opinions. Um, ethos is that, well, you show that you know what you're talking about, that you have the merits to claim that whatever you're saying is true. Um, and when you've laid the ground with logos and ethos, you can actually go into pathos, with, which is emotions. So if people trust you and you've proven your, your uh, track record with, the, with logos, then you can start saying uh, weird stuff or just like, this product is just amazing, all right? So I'm going to show you a few examples of, of how those three principles uh, have been applied to uh, the pattern of social proof. Um, this first is, uh, is Yelp. I searched for a beer in Munich. Uh, that was uh, an obvious thing to do for this trip. And um, this is a great example of how uh, Logos is used to, and social proof is used to guide my decisions in what place to choose. So it seems like, well, Hofbrauhaus, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's probably a touristy place. 
I would say, compared to Lemon because it hasn't got as, as high rating. Uh, so the Augustino killer is, is probably uh, the best place to go. So I use these principles, the principle of social proof that affects my decisions. So you can use that, you can apply the principle of social proof simply by showing numbers actually with logos to guide your user's decisions. All right. This is the old marketing site for Basecamp. Um, a really uh, one of my favorite products. And I, it's not up uh, anymore, but I really like how they tell it. Um, they have stuff like meet your milestones and deadlines. That's a pretty big promise. Um, keep all your project files in one place. And then on the top, Basecamp is so simple, you can't do anything wrong. Basecamp is addictively easy to use. And it's, it's backed up by, by Ethos with Robert Hoff from Business Week. Right? So that's pathos, using emotions. Then if we look at ethos, it's really, really simple tools that you can use to show ethos. Just showing the logos of respected companies that use this product. That makes me think, well, if these guys are, are using this product, well, it's, it's probably good enough for me as well. All right, so that's uh, rhetoric. Another thing I, I think that needs to be in place is this talk about features and benefits. And first, I had done it features versus benefits because, well, benefits is important. But actually, the two are important because you need to talk about the concept and you need the users to understand what you're actually doing, right? But f benefits are probably more important, especially when we're developers or business developers or uh, people really involved in our product. We, are, we have been uh, in the mind of this product for a year or two, just a few months. We tend to think only about the attributes, what it can do, how great it is, how fast it is. Um, but for the user's perspective, it doesn't really matter. Um, Samuel Hollick did this uh, great illustration, I think. And he talked about uh, what are you actually, he asked the question, what are you building? So if you're Mario and there's some flower, is that what you're building? He says, well, no. It's the guy, awesome guy who can throw fireballs because he ate the flower, right? So he's describing, he's describing the benefits of using this and focusing on the benefits instead of the product itself. So let me give you two examples again about, of, of two different uh, companies who, um, who focus either mostly on features or mostly on benefits. Um, Sevolution is a, a product that does uh, heat maps. They do a pretty good, about, a pretty good job about uh, explaining that. They do heat maps. You can see every click, mouse move, and scroll. You got click heat maps, you got eye tracking, you got scroll, you got attention. That's like the description of the product. That's like developer talking right there, I think. Then the new kid on the block, Hotjar, they do it a bit differently. They have all those features, heat maps and recordings and funnels and forms and all that stuff. Same thing, they have this, all the stuff there. But then they actually say, well, Hotjar is a new and easy way to truly understand your web and mobile site visitors. Identify your hottest opportunities for improvement. Now, as a user, if I didn't know about heat maps, I had no chance to understand what and why that other uh, Cvolution product was important to me. But here, I can identify my hottest opportunities. That's a takeaway. So all this is about asking, from the user's perspective, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? And this is just one solution out of many that can help me identify my hardest opportunities. But ask what's in it for me. That's a great test. If you have a marketing page, go through it and say, now I'm, I've been in the user's shoes. Can I see what's in it for me? And if you can't answer that question, you need to rework it. All right. So. That's about communication, how I should approach it. Um, let's get to the patterns. So people are probably interested. Let's see if we can close the deal. Again, some examples um, of three different effective ways uh, of closing the deal. There are many other patterns, but, but and, uh, I don't have time for that. If you were at the workshop yesterday, I would show a lot more. Um, but I'm going to focus on these four principles, these four cards. Um, 
And they're all pretty simple, actually. This is kayak.com. You can search for hotels, flights, cars, and different uh, travel packages. And uh, they use, again, scarcity. Uh, when I, I search for this uh, plane ticket to Austin, it's uh, south by southwest time. There's only three seats left. Um, this is a service that's similar in a lot of different companies and a lot of different products. But, and, and Kayak.com knows that. So they need to force me to make a decision because I could just as well make that decision to buy on another site. So they use scarcity to force me to make a decision right now by saying that there's only three seats left. This is hard jar again. Um, they've got a pretty busy site. Uh, it's got a menu, it's got a lot of ethos uh, logos down there. Uh, but when you click sign up, it looks like this. Everything is stripped away. They close off all detours. So what they do is that they, they create a predetermined sequence of actions, a path, um, step by step. So when they lead people into a tunnel, from that point on, they control everything. And they control all the sequences that I'm going through. So that allows for actually using different patterns along the way and presenting it in a way that uh, makes a user take action or do uh, your intended action. Um, so this concept is called tunneling. And um, because I'm me, I need a, 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 an example um, of my own from me. Uh, this is my cards. My, uh, I've got this, uh, this page where you can win the cards if you enter it. Uh, so of course, there's uh, the rewards. Uh, and people enter uh, this competition uh, because they want to win uh, the deck. But that's not actually the point. Because what I tried to do, at least, and it actually, it, it actually worked and increased um, worked before. What, what I actually do is this normal competition you need to answer a question uh, about uh, the different patterns uh, and then enter your name and email. And then it says up there, only one can win. But don't worry, everybody who enters the competition receives a good offer on the Persuasive Patterns card deck. So here I got, well, people are interested because they, if, if they enter the competition, they are interested in the cards. But what I also do is that I, I get them to say yes to me, uh, to allow me to contact them again with an offer. So they actually expect that. So the principle what I try to use here is called commitment and consistency. So the commitment and consistency principle uh, dictates that well, if we make people do a small commitment, they're more likely to say yes to something larger later. So sometimes it's, it's kind of like a cold calling people. That's, that's a hard sell. So this is warming up the leads, right? Whoop. Um, another way you can get uh, people to come close to the deal or get more engaged in, uh, in, in your product is, is by getting them to put in an investment up front. This, uh, this is uh, a site called Stitch Fix. Um, it's a subscription service for women's clothing. So the concept is that you get a package each month based on uh, your uh, preferred style. So you have to fill out a style pro profile first for it to work so they know what kind of clothes you like. So when I click Get Started, I'm, I'm taken to this form. And it's not like the regular sign-up form. Um, it's, it's, it's actually kind of crazy. Um, and they could probably use some of the principles that uh, I use in this course you know, or use in this, uh, this deck, but still, this has a purpose. I tried it out and it, it took me just around an hour actually to, to fill out. But it works. People stick around because they invest their time. So whenever we in invest our time in something or money or whatever, uh, we kind of see the time as, uh, we don't see it as sunk cost, we just think, oh, I need to get some investment out of whatever I put into it. So we stick around. So can we get people to, to invest time or effort or create documents or uh, anything that they feel that they will stand to lose afterwards when you prompt for conversion? Then the likelihood of them staying or saying yes is higher. So this is the endowment effect that we 
when we place, uh, when we feel we own something or possess something, we feel a sentimental value about that, and then change our perception on it, and then value it more. All right, so that was the first part about seeing, being seduced. We talked about rhetorics, benefits, or features. What's in it for me, closing the deal? So the first one, first part was about just basic communication that you need to have in place. And uh, the last two is, is where we start to, to apply these persuasive patterns. All right, so um, next up is falling in love. Um, one of the dangers of, of doing, uh, using persuasive patterns is that it's not usability. So we don't focus on the user by default. Uh, the danger is that we, we sometimes just think about well, what do we want the user to do? And that's a business goal, not a, not a user goal, right? So that's why it's really, really, really important that we uh, kind of keep those in check. But no matter what we do, we can't do any efforts in, uh, in, in conversion or persuasion or anything if we don't define our goals. So start with defining your goals. So take your business goals or behavioral goals, which they actually are, and say, so what, what do we want? Well, it could be that we want users to upload more pictures or get more page views because we want to show banners. It could, be, it could be a lot of different things. And then afterwards, then look at the user goals. And user goals are very different. Um, we tend to have a, uh, an idea of users actually knowing what they want, but it's something else almost, uh, most often. It could be, I want, just want something that others don't. So that could be satisfied in many different ways with your product or another product. It could also be that, well, I just want to feel good about myself, or I want to, I want to do really good. I want to be good about what I'm doing. Um, I want to get acknowledged by, for my work or get feedback or yeah, anything. And so what you do is that you take the user goals, combine it with the, user, with the business goals, and then find the sweet spot in the middle. So that's what it's about. So take all those different goals and find out which ones match. And then you have a solid ground to work from. If you don't do that, if you, if you don't focus only on, on business goals, well, then users are probably going to drop out sooner or later. And then you're not being honest. Then you're not delivering value to users. And if you focus only on user goals, well, then there's a chance you won't make money. So you need to focus on both. So as an example of how you can combine this, I want to show you an example of, um, of last FM. And, um, on my site, UIPatterns.com, I collect a lot of screenshots, so I actually have a lot of history uh, on, on how these services evolve. And um, this is the way uh, LastFM greeted you uh, five years ago. They just had, well, just, they needed my music preferences. Um, LastFM, by the way, is, is a, a radio station, online radio station, where you can, it just plays your music, and if you like the music that's playing, you, you click love. And, um, and then plays more music like that. So obviously they're interested in, in my music taste. And this is how they, they, they greeted me first. They just asked me, what kind of music do we like? And it's been a while actually since I identified with my, myself with what kind of music I was listening to. I don't do that anymore, just, I just listen to the music I like. S but I did at some point. So what I entered here was just whatever came onto my mind. There was, there was Nirvana, there was Guns N' Roses, there was Metallica. All the bands that I listened to as a teenager, but if they put that on now, it would seem really awkward. It would seem like a teenage room. And uh, I mean, that's, that's not really good either for working or just uh, chilling with my friends. So um, they got, I mean, on top of that, it was actually really hard to remember. They didn't get any uh, like valuable insights about me. They got three bands that I, I like, but I don't listen to them anymore that much. This is how they've done it right now. So they just present me with a list of different, uh, different artists. And it's both people I, I listen to a lot and, and don't, but I would say, well, David Bowie, I like him. Um, so I'll check him off. And Kendrick Lamar, yeah, I went to his concert a few years ago. So yeah, let's take him. And suddenly I had actually chosen four. That was actually more than before, right? So then I also found that there was this refresh artist button up there. So I clicked it and more came up. And what I found was that 
the bands that came up reflected the ones I had chosen over there. So that got me kind of exciting because, excited because I wanted to see if it got better and better and better. I wanted to see if I could kind of game the system to see if it was intelligent enough. So I ended up putting 30 bands in. All right, so Last FM did really good there because their business goal probably was to get a lot of, uh, of, of information about my music preferences. That's what they need to del deliver value to me. So they found this sweet spot in the middle. So why did it work? Well, there was this principle uh, called recognition or recall uh, that it's easier to recognize things um, from a list than it is to recall, to recall them from memory. So we hate to spend brain energy, like, uh, I mean, whenever we can, we just try to avoid it, like any rational thought, whatever. Um, so if we present it to something where it's just really easy to pick, we'd, we'd just rather like that. Um, and it turned out that they actually got a, lo a lot more information out of me. If I wanted to type in uh, Metallica, Nirvana, or whatever, I could put it in the search field. So also in the design, they have recognition, that's pretty big, and over-recall. So recall is important, but it's recognition over-recall, right? That's a good design principle. They also have this thing up here to say, to give you great recommendations, we need to know about your current music taste. So from what I can read from there, uh, I get that, well, if I put something in, I'm getting something in return, right? So, so there's a feedback loop. And we're engaged by, by seeing how our action, actions influence uh, whatever results I get back. And we tend to interact more if there's a, a fast feedback loop. Then I also click the refresh artist button. So, so I try to kind of game the system. And we're triggered by this pattern recognition whenever we can. Um, and, and seem to be engaged in continuing that kind of behavior. All right, so um, we're talking about falling in love. And falling, about, falling in love is about exposing your best parts. It's where you get to know each other and you want to show yourself to your partner uh, or to your customer uh, in, your best, in the best possible way, right? So you want people to do something so that they see how great you are. So this is about reinforcing behavior. So it's about rewards, you could say. Um, one example of that is, um, yeah, I'm going to show you two effective ways of doing that. One, e <laughs> one example of that is Facebook. I've got this page called UIPatterns.com on Facebook. And Facebook, in their insights uh, section, provide me a, a way of kind of gauging how, how well I'm doing to see my status compared to the other guys. So that let me pick my competitors, and then I can, I can in a high score, uh, see how well I'm doing. So this allows me to see, well, I got more speed on uh, both Specuboy or Usability, so at least I'm doing good. It might take me a while to get up on the others, but I can see I got more speed, so I'm doing well. And I can also see that if, if my speed, the 3.2%, if that decreases, then I probably need to do something. So there's a feedback loop there, and it, it engages me because I can, I can constantly see how well I'm doing and, and react on that. So here there's, there's points. Uh, points in itself doesn't engage me, but it allows me to, um, uh, to, to kind of see how I'm standing and, and, and s compare myself to my competitors. So you can't, just can't put points on anything, just points is a, uh, is, is a tool for, compar for, for comparison. Um, then uh, there's also the status. Uh, I can see how well I'm doing and uh, the fact that I can constantly go in and check if I'm doing better than the others, uh, that engages me as well, that gives me purpose, right? Um, and then a sense of achievement if I actually go up uh, one spot to number three. Um, it gives me something to strive for. So that's a very metrically driven approach. Uh, some would call it gamification. Um, there's also kind of like a, a softer side. Um, this is one, like, one of my favorite examples of that. It's, it's National Geographic. Um, if you don't know National Geographic, it's a print magazine. Uh, it has really, really, really 
beautiful, beautiful pictures of, uh, of, of uh, nature, uh, mostly. Um, the readers of National Geographic, um, well, at least some of them uh, are, a lot of them are, are aspiring photographers. They dream of one day being in the magazine. So National Geographic has created this section called yourshot.com. And it caters exactly to those aspiring photographers. So the photo editors of National Geographic put out an assignment to these, uh, these aspiring photog photographers every single week. S and so it's kind of like having, a, 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 having been given a job by a photographer and being sent out in the field. Now you need to take pictures of hunger and hope become, because that's up in the next magazine or whatever, or macro. So why does this work? Well, their storytelling, I can engage in, in whatever narrative they're providing me. Uh, I can go in and in hunger and hope, and we want to we, we feel engaged by a story. We want to get into it. We want to think about how we can portray hunger and hope. There's appropriate challenges. If I am a rookie photographer, I know that I'm probably not going to win, but at least I'll get comments on my, on my uh, photos. So at least there's, there's some s sort of achievement. Um, so this works but for both the totally newbies and the seasoned photographers who will probably win this each assignment. There's also reputation because the better you get, uh, the more points you get, the more, uh, more you're voted up, uh, the more you rise in reputation. And then uh, reciprocation that when we feel that people give something to us, we feel that we owe them. And we tend to uh, say yes to those we owe. And reciprocation in, in this sense is, is people investing time in us, commenting on our work, um, being able to be part of the brand. So this example is a lot more softer. So you can use all these persuasive patterns in both a very metrical-driven way and a more soft way. And the softer way, at least in this case, talks to our more, more inner motivation. Another part about falling in love is, is about guiding your partner. I mean, if we're just new to each other, how should I know what you like, right? So we need to guide our users. This is the onboarding sequence of, um, of um, LinkedIn. And I really admire LinkedIn. They're, they they use these patterns all over. Uh, some would argue too much in, in, in some cases, um, but this is what greets me when I when I first sign up for LinkedIn. So here uh, there is a big blue box um, where I kind of like need to fill in the blanks. Um, I would say this is a use of the intentional gaps pattern. That's at least what I call it. So can we create different gaps uh, that, uh, that, was, uh, that our users can't help but fill? Um, it looks incomplete, and it's actually really easy to fill out job title at some company. Then they have parted a really complex sequence of event events, like filling out a resume. That's, that's actually a pretty daunting big task into, into something very simple, or five different simple tasks. So we are more likely to take action if it doesn't seem that complex, if you can make something seem simple. And we do that by sequencing it, by parting it up in different events. And then, of course, when I'm done with each step, I feel complete. And the closer I get to being finished, the more complete I will feel. So good guidance, some quick tips. You want to get people started. You want to pe people to get right along, dive in. So support them practice, practicing, right? Provide a safe, safe waters. You want to facilitate exploration. You want to reinforce behavior that gets them around your product. You want to set achievable goals so that they, uh, they feel success. And you want to uh, allow prompt feedback all the time on whatever action they do then let them know how that affected whatever they did or affected your product. Also, there's something that you, you sh shouldn't do. You, sh you should avoid the obvious. So, I mean, for instance, those tours that are really popular right now with you have to, like eight steps you have to click through to, to understand this new feature, 
I couldn't care less. Let me just explore. So sometimes it can become too obvious, right? And don't get in the way. For me, at least, I, I think that like models popping up, disturbing my flow, is really, uh, really, really annoying. I mean, it actually sometimes it just makes me quit altogether. Avoid repetition. If somebody, if, if you told somebody something once already. Don't do it again. Now, this is kind of hard because somebody, sometimes people don't know that you've told them. So it's a careful balance, but at least allow escape. Make it possible to dismiss that message. Cool. Next up is, or let's just sum up, actually. So it's about aligning user goals and business goals. And when you've got that in place, you need to try to expose your best parts in order for your users to fall in love with you. Otherwise, they don't know what your product is about. Otherwise, they don't understand the value that you're trying to provide them. And you can do that by reinforcing behavior through rewards in a metric-driven way, softer way, uh, and guiding them well. All right, so that's about falling in love. Now, staying in love is a bit harder. And there are not no real, really good tricks here. Um, but you could part up, well, one way of looking at motivation is, is parting up in, in these three different kinds. Tangent motivation, extrinsic motivation, and intrinsic motivation. So tangent motivation is the kind that doesn't really have anything to do with what you're trying to accomplish, but it gets people moving. What's better is extrinsic motivation. Um, for instance, a uh, salary be motivated by some material reward, something out from outside that makes us do something. And then the intrinsic motiv motivation that comes from the inside because we want to master it. So let's go through each of them. Tangent motivation first. I don't know, have you seen this on LinkedIn? I think they put it off now, I put it away now, but have you seen this? Probably a lot of you, well, at least I did, uh, I started out with 25% uh, and suddenly I was up to 60, 80. It got me going, but whatever I had to fill out didn't have anything to do what, with, with my actual goal of going into LinkedIn. And at some point I dropped out, I, I got up to 80%, so it did do something good for LinkedIn, but well, I don't actually know anybody who actually got up to 100%. But it got me going. But at one point, it was just stuck out there and as an annoyance that just popped up in my face every time I got into LinkedIn. And it was actually just really annoying. But it got me going in the first place, right? So this is completion. I'm triggered by that. This is a uh, carpet shop um, that's close to where I live. Uh, it sells carpets. It says we're closing. Um, it's been closing for eight years now. Um, I mean, if you bought a, a carpet from there like five years ago and you went back, went back the, the year after, you would probably be kind of disappointed, right? But they play on scarcity. So the fact that, well, they're closing now, everything uh, must go, there's only a few days left, uh, you need to act now or you will lose the opportunity forever. So that's tangent motivation. What about like, extrinsic? So extrinsic, that could be high scores. That's a classic example. Um, the problem with high scores is that only, in this case, 10 can be on the list. Uh, and it's really motivating for maybe top 20, but for the 1,000 people under that, it's actually demotivating. But it keeps some people going, at least. And that's probably also why they have six different high scores, right? So there's competition. We strive to be in that position, right? Uh, there's also the sense of achievement of, of, of being in the list, on the list. Um, another example uh, of extrinsic motivation is, uh, is Stack Overflow. And they actually combine the extrinsic motivation with, with an intrinsic as well, because there are a lot of different high scores. You can be the altruistic kind of guy or get that badge if you do certain actions, or you could be the critic. So if I, see my, if, if I identify myself with a critic, that actually taps into my inner motivations of who I see I am. But still, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of it comes from the outside. It's points driven. It's metric. That's achievements. Um, intrinsic motivation. And this really, really goes well together with staying in love. So 
Intrinsic motivation is about learning. It's about mastery. Um, so it's about creating learning challenges. But it's also about designing the experience over time. So kind of like a video game, if you start out, you'll probably say, I'll start in easy, then I'm going to move up as I progress and my skill level increases. And when I'm really good, I'll play as an expert, right? But if, I'm, if, I'm, if I can manage the expert level, then the easy level will be a waste of time. So this, um, this is the, the, uh, the flow theory. It uh, says that well, it, when we start out, um, or just at any point, if a task compared to our skill level is too boring, then it will drop out. So if it's too easy to do, it's, it gets boring. If it's too hard to do compared to our skill level, then we'll feel stressed and anxiety and we'll also drop out. The problem with this is that our skill level increases. So when we get better, um, this, the challenge that we face right now probably isn't good enough. So we need something harder. So it's a careful dance keeping people in the flow channel because our skill level increases. Um, a, um, a week ago, one and a half week ago, uh, I played my first gig with my new band. So we set up a Facebook page, right? Uh, it's called Cloudbreak. We are nothing. We're really small. But what I noticed is that they, um, they gave me, Facebook gave me a milestone. And it's an inappropriate challenge. For where I am right now, I just created the page. Uh, I, can get, I can reach the milestone of 100 likes. So this stands in contrast to the high score that uh, Facebook helped me set up later. So the high score is, is good for uh, where I am with my UI patterns page, right? But for, uh, for Cloudbreak, a high score would just be ridiculous because there would be so, uh, so far up to, to whoever I want to beat. So that's appropriate challenges. Um, and Facebook are good at that. It's also about uh, actually um, giving powers to people because if you want to, you can just promote the page by paying, of course, but you get more powers. And that's actually a big part of the business model. So it's about aligning business and user goals. and need to match. Otherwise, you'll just get this one-night stand. So your job is to, to find the sweet spot in the middle. Okay? So when I've been testing these cards, um, I've seen that some patterns um, tend to go with extrinsic motivation and some go with intrinsic, but there are no rules. But generally, my observation is that points, levels, scoreboards, and metrically driven patterns, they go uh, well with extrinsic motivation. And, uh, and reputation, self-identification, and uh, things like that go well with uh, intrinsic motivation. Um, but the problem is that the intrinsic motivation is within the user. It's what the user wants. So we can't fake it. But we can amplify that intrinsic motivation, that feeling for mastery, by using persuasive design patterns. So what we can do if we have intrinsic motivation, stuff that comes from within, we can constrain it. Because we know what people want, and let's help them get there by constructing a path. So that's kind of what, what Hardjar did with, the, with closing everything off, because they know that if, if they want to deliver value to the users, they need to get people, uh, the, the customers, into this tunnel. Right? What you can also do is to facilitate the intrinsic motivation, make it easier for people to be motivated or to, to discover the value that, that motivates them, that drives them forward toward their goal, toward mastery. So this is actually kind of the conclusion of this. We, there are different aspects of persuasion and, and, or different uh, ways you need to tackle your efforts. And you need to think about where the user is in the journey. All right? So persuasive design patterns can be used to seduce users to sign up for your product and you to start using it. But you can only facilitate intrinsic motivation for real ongoing use. That's it. And um, 
of course, uh, this is if you want to test it out, um, please come to me after the session. And I've got a, I've got a couple of these uh, these sets. Um, we played around with them in the workshop yesterday, and, and I'm sp spending my uh, my efforts right now actually trying to to perfect them and, and find the right uh, way to use them. Um, if you want to try them out, I've got a couple lying around that you can, you can get. So um, just come over to me and ask. That's it. <laughs>